So, I'm going to do a series of videos, I've decided, as I get asked a lot of questions on cable design uh, for audio cables. This is not uh, nothing else yet. So just audio cables, uh, some of the science behind it, some of the myths, uh, pseudoscience, because I know that in the audio community there's, uh, there's cable believers who really believe that cables make all the difference and uh, it's worth spending the money on them and you get a lot of people that just say it's all nonsense and it makes no difference. I'm kind of just somewhere in between. I certainly feel that you can hear the difference between a really bad cable and a really good cable. I think there's, I think there's something there that could just be, just be placebo. So I'm going to go through some of the science behind it and then hopefully if you believe in cables you'll, you'll see that you were right and hopefully if you disbelieve in cables You'll also see you're right, because confirmation bias, you'll just take from it what you want. Uh, but anyway, so this first one's going to be pretty basic. We're just going to kind of get on the same level, and then we're going to go into some probably slightly more in-depth science and maths in the later ones. But let's start off with a really easy one. Sound, what is sound? So as we're dealing with audio cables, dealing with sound, and sound is just pressure waves in air. Uh, so you'll see the speaker driver or headphone driver move in and out that compresses the air and forms a series of compressions which are picked up by your ears and turned into sound in your brain somewhere. Now then, uh, human hearing range is normally around 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, that's 20,000 hertz. As you get a bit older and your tympanic membrane kind of stiffens up a bit, that will get reduced down, the upper limit will probably go down to 16 kilohertz, something like that. So you lose a little bit of that upper range uh, when you age. There are ways of getting around that using bone conducting transducers. You can still hear frequencies above that. But just to be certain, uh, when you're at a live event, there are frequencies above and below that, which we can perceive even if we can't hear them. So you could potentially notice the lack of them. You wouldn't get that live feeling if those additional frequencies weren't there. I don't know that for certain, but it, it might be the case. Um, so frequencies below 20 hertz, you can feel through your proprioceptive system. You can feel it in your body. So that's why before thunderstorms and earthquakes and stuff like that, animals get all a bit weird because they can kind of sense it. And again, so so, I've seen studies that show that you can probably detect a one hertz compression wave in the air. You can't hear it, but you can feel it. Uh, and also, again, there have been studies with very high frequencies, like about 60 kilohertz, I think it was. And even though you can't hear it, they've done scans of the brain and they can show that, uh, that there's, there's some kind of reaction there. So you're not hearing it you can detect it in some way and therefore possibly the absence of it. So just for safety's sake, we'll say that the, the, the frequency range that we're looking at is one hertz to a hundred kilohertz. So 20 kilohertz should be fine. We'll go up to a hundred just because that will definitely cover anything that maybe we can perceive physically. That way you cover all the all the what's it's Okay, so uh, next one we're going to look at is impedance. So when you're dealing with cables, you'll often have a DC resist resistance. So you'll measure that with a multimeter. It'll tell you how many ohms it is. Impedance is slightly different. It's, uh, so rather than the DC, it's normally an AC signal, which is what you're dealing with with audio. And impedance can vary with frequency. So DC resistance will always be the same. There are some instances where impedance will change with frequency. And when you're dealing with audio, you want to make sure that the frequencies that we're looking at between 1 hertz and 100 kilohertz are the same impedance. You, you don't want to have the top end roll off or the bottom end roll off, ideally, when you're designing a cable. Okay, so uh, material choice. So when you're looking at cables, you'll often see copper, OFC, OCC, you'll see silver, you'll see silver plated copper. There's all kinds of different material choices when we're making it. Uh, generally, most copper wire these days is OFC, which is just a, a level of its purity. So OFC is normally 99.99% pure copper. Um, so if we look at OCC, which you'll see 
uh, in there. That's a continuously cast copper. And the idea behind that is the, the crystal structure in the copper. If you can cool it slow enough, you pretty much get a single crystal rather than lots of little crystal boundaries. And that makes it more durable because there's n less places where it can break in the crystal boundaries. And uh, I think it's slightly more conductive, certainly more conductive to heat, slightly more conductive to electricity, but only, only slightly. But it's basically a higher grade of copper. So if you see a cable that's advertising that it's made of OCC, you know it's probably a good copper. The thing that I would caution you against is if you're looking especially at Chinese cables or something from a, a, a smaller brand that you maybe haven't heard of, there's no guarantee that you're getting OCC. It could be anything. Uh, there's no way for you to test whether you've got it really without a lot of equipment. So I would pretty much ignore that unless you're buying it from a reputable company. OFC is fine and I'm sure the cable is fine. OCC costs a lot more because of the casting method. And a lot of these companies will just slap the letters on there and it doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, another thing that you'll see when you're looking is how many ends it is. They'll say this is made of 5N copper or 6N copper. Uh, that is how many nines are in the 99.99999. So I think 4N is 99.99, which would be normal OFC, 5N, 99.999% pure, going up from there. I have seen a few cables advertised as 7N and uh, anything above 5 I would be suspicious of. Because if you, if you have a look online, try and buy go uh, copper ingots, which is what they would need to make the material, it's very difficult to get above 6N. Uh, well, it's very difficult to get above five. You can sometimes find six. I've not seen any seven uh, legitimately out there. I don't think you can test much above five. So, uh, so yeah, anything above five, this is kind of a bit of guesswork anyway. OCC would obviously be, you know, in that kind of range, you know, the six, seven. But uh, I, again, I would pretty much ignore it because, you know, there's no way of testing. Uh, so, uh, again, if it's a cheap cable and it's saying seven N, it's probably nonsense. Um, so then we move on to the silver cables. Now silver is obviously a lot more expensive and um, it is slightly more conductive. So if you made the same cable from silver as you did from copper, the silver cable would be more conductive. It's about, but it's only about 7% more conductive than copper. So there's not a huge amount of difference and certainly when we've been making cables we tend to just use thicker copper because if you double the cross-sectional area of copper you, re you halve the impedance. So going to silver it's much cheaper just to go fat copper rather than going to silver. Silver's nice, you know, if you've got the money you get the bragging rights. I've got a silver cable but um, if it's a very thin silver cable a fatter copper, so, uh, fatter copper cable is going to have a lower impedance than silver. Uh, the next one is going to be silver plated copper. And so that would be a copper wire with a, which is then plated with silver. The reason they normally do this, I believe, is so that you can get a Teflon insulator because Teflon doesn't play nicely going directly onto copper. So they silver plate it and then they can put Teflon over the top, which is a really nice uh, dielectric to use. Uh, it's also very durable, so it's used in a lot of like military vehicles, stuff like that, because it's, it's resistant to chemicals, it won't, won't melt, that kind of stuff. But uh, the, advanced, the, the, the reason that you see SPC a lot is because yeah, it's, it's, it's come from other industries and then people are making headphones, headphone and audio cables from that. Well, uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so next we're going to look at cryo treatment which is where they take the audio cable or the connector and they will drop the temperature down to cryogenic levels, so kind of liquid nitrogen almost temperatures. And they'll slowly, if it's done well, they'll slowly bring it down and then slowly raise it up again. Initially I thought that was nonsense because from what I understand of metallurgy, uh, you normally have to kind of quench the metal when it's hot to change the crystal structure or cool it very slowly. But it turns out the annealing process can actually continue and cryo treatment does do something. Uh, yeah, so everything shrinks and kind of rearranges ever so slightly. 
which makes the material slightly stronger and slightly more conductive. But another thing to look out for when you're looking at these cable listings, if they say it's 7N copper or OCC and they say it's also cryo-treated, then that's just nonsense. Because if you've already got a single crystal continuously cast, you're not going to get any advantage from cryo-treating it. It's, it's, it's got no crystal structure to rearrange. Um, so, so again, they might be doing that, but why would you bother? Uh, if you've got decent OCC copper cryo-treating it, it's not going to not gonna change anything. All right, next we have the skin effect. I don't necessarily want to cover this in an early video, but it relates to some other stuff that we're talking about, so I'm going to only go through that. So essentially, if you've got a round conductor, the skin depth is affected by the frequency of the signal that you've got. So a very high frequency will actually only travel through the outer part of the cable, meaning there's no signal coming through here and you're actually going to get slightly higher impedance for the very high frequencies because they're traveling through less of the copper. So as the frequency goes up, the skin depth gets smaller. For our example, where we're looking at 100 kilohertz, uh, the skin depth would be around 0.2 millimeters, and obviously you've got 0.2 millimeters this side, 0.2 millimeters that side, so 0.4 millimeters. So that would mean if you had a wire of 0.9 or more millimeters, then you're going to start to see some skin effect at the 100 kilohertz range, and then. If we're looking at 20 kilohertz, that's around 0.46 millimeters. So basically anything over one millimeter, let's say, um, you're going to start to see some kind of skin effect at the, at the upper end of human hearing range. So for headphone cables, it's not such a big thing because then like one millimeter is quite fat for a, for a core on a headphone cable. But certainly speaker cables, it's worth taking into account because they will often be a few mil across so you're going to get some kind of skin effect with a standard cable. Um, that's where we're going to get onto the construction and geometry because we use um, we tend to use lits wire for most of our most of our cables and the difference being with a normal cable it's made up of lots of strands And all those strands are touching and they're conductive and it basically acts like one big fat wire, which gives you a, you know, so say you're using a two mil, it's going to act like a two mil wire. You're going to get some kind of skin effect at the high end. With lit, every conductor has a coating on the outside, which stops the charge traveling from one to the other. So each one acts like a very tiny cable. Uh, so for example, the wires in ours are like 0.071 millimeters across. Uh, yeah, so you wouldn't get any kind of skin effect till you get up to like 700, ooh, it's about 700 kilohertz, I think. Uh, yeah, so we can go really fat with our wire without having to worry about skin effect because we're using lids. Um, so that's that's one thing to look at. Another another thing that you'll notice. Let's rub some light off. Ugh, brown. Why did I use brown? Uh, <laughs> another thing you'll notice uh, when you're looking at cables is some of them are braided or twisted pairs. So if you've got normal wire which is straight, this has got a charge going through it, and basically the charge in this wire can re induce a current in the wire next to it because they're running in parallel. So you can get a little bit of crosstalk. Also, if you've ever looked at a, a capacitor, it's basically a metal plate with an insulator and another metal plate. And again, with your straight cable, that's what you've got. So you've got a conductor and an insulator and you can build up a charge on here. So it gives it a little bit of capacitance. And capacitance varies with frequency again. So, uh, the, sorry, the, the the impedance of a capacitor varies with frequency, so again, you could get some kind of uh, interaction there. So, by braiding it, 
you know, so they're all crossing over and they're not parallel with each other. You don't get as much cross talk and you can reduce the capacitance. Uh, and again, if you open up a network cable or something like that, you'll see that in there you've got twisted pairs rather than straight wires, which stops cross talk between the different channels. So that is real. Uh, sorry, nearly forgot to go back to SPC. Uh, as you can imagine with the, with the skin effect we were talking about, that's where SPC possibly gets interesting because you've got silver coating on the outside of a copper core. The silver coating's got a lower impedance. So potentially where the high frequencies are pushed to the outside, they will end up in the lower frequency, uh, the lower impedance silver. And you can maybe get a little bit more sparkle at the top end going to SPC. I don't know whether, that, you know, that's probably nonsense. It's probably pseudoscience, but you know, there's, there's, there's something there. There's something there. You, you, you might maybe, possibly that might be where people seem to hear a difference when they're going to SPC cables. Uh, another one, which is great, which people, uh, people love is cable burning. This is another thing where there's a bit of an argument. Oh, is it real? Is it not real? So I personally don't think it makes any difference, especially not to our cables, which are going to be lit cables, but let's imagine it's true for a second. Let's imagine that cable burning is real and try and explain why it occurs. So again, when you've got your normal copper cable made of many strands, when you first get that cable, uh, as we mentioned before, it all acts as one big old cable because there's charge traveling between each of the cores because they're all touching each of the strands because they're all touching. Now then, potentially if you didn't have great copper in there or didn't have a very good uh, insulator around it, the outside of this copper is going to start to oxidize and so but have you seen on copper you get that green build up and copper oxide isn't as conductive well i think i think copper oxide isn't conductive so essentially your cable is going to end up a bit more like lits over time uh, as the charge won't be able to move between one strand and another as easily because there's bits of copper oxide around it so that could potentially be what it is you know if you used it for a while with the charge going through it, it's going to increase the oxidization rate. So potentially a copper cable can become a bit more like a Litz copper cable over time, which might be cable burning. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions about that, stick them in the comments. Uh, and then subscribe if you want to hear the next one we go, where we go a little bit more in depth with some of the, some of the maths behind it and science. And, and more of the nonsense. We like audio nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoop, whoop, whoop.